Hey, this is Mark Taylor. I'm editor of Christian Standard Magazine and publisher of Christian Standard Media and enjoying my time at the 2016 NACC in Anaheim, California and, and enjoying talking to several of the people who are helping to make this convention happen. Today we're talking to Mike Cope. I want to make sure, I, he's got two titles, I want to make sure I've got them right. One is Director of Ministry Outreach at Pepperdine here in, in California up in Malibu. He's also the full-time preacher at the Gulf Road Church of Christ in Midland, Texas. One of those uh, two career guys. I'm surprised you had time to even be here, Mike. <laughs> I, I think I'm the only person to this day offered a chance to live in Malibu who chose Midland, Texas instead. It's cheaper in Midland, isn't it? It's cheaper in Midland, but it's 107 today. Oh, so. my goodness. Well, that's what's why you're here. I think it's 76 in, That's That's why you're here. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. How, to, for, before we get into other stuff, how does yeah. that work? There's other people out there con considering doing something like this. So yeah. how does that work? Well, it's even more complicated than that. I preached for 20 years in Abilene at uh, the... the Highland Church of Christ. So that's kind of home for long term. That's where the house we own is. So every week we're back and forth from Midland to Abilene. It's just a couple hours away. Oh, but, that's but I'm still... senior senior pastor at the church in Midland. And then I just fly out to Pepperdine as I need to. And in this day and age, so much of what I need to do can be done through social media, Dropbox, whatever. Well, that's cool. <laughs> that's cool. It's a, you're, you're very uh, uh, current in, in tune with the I work the, with the young times. people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> That's the key. Yeah. Well, at, at the convention here, you're you're leading a workshop around a, a topic that you've spoken about a lot. Yeah. Because of a tragedy in, in your life in 1994, your little your little Megan, 10 years old, passed away. Yeah. Long. It's a long time. That's 20. Yeah, 22 years. Two years. Yeah. And you're still talking about it. Is it a blessing to talk about it, or has it become a a burden no, to keep I, talking I, about? No, I still it? find it a blessing, and and I think as I inch into 60 here in a couple of weeks, um, I need, now think that I'm at a different place in life, of course. Sure. And, and it wasn't just Megan's death. It was, it was a series of events. It was uh, our daughter's death, and then five years later, my 15-year-old nephew's death, and then five years later, a tragic wreck at our church that nearly took the life of my son, did take the life of the boy next to him, and left eight children in a ditch with various, various injuries. And so for me, it was, it was the kind of stuff in ministry that you didn't get trained for in seminary. You know, you got trained for church history and well, Greek and Hebrew and so families, on. For other people's families, let alone your own. Yeah, yeah, that, uh, that you would wind up ministering out of depletion, out of, and, and some of the things I'll, I'll be talking about, one is that those griefs stack. They're not silos, they're not different things, but each time something came, it's like, it aggravated the one before and expanded its depth. And I know a lot of people who maybe will watch this have experienced that. Maybe it's um, something that's happened in a marriage or with their children or their parents or church or something. And they find that those, those griefs stack. And the second thing that I couldn't have anticipated is through it all, I, I remained the minister. I was the pastor. When that wreck happened, the church needed to be nurtured back to health. And even when my daughter died, the church lost a 10-year-old girl that they had prayed over and over for. So part of it fell on me to nurture them back to faith and health. And what I found at the end is, after that third round, uh, uh, I just had to call a time out. I had to step out and enter into a time of therapy and recovery uh, to fill back up my own life, my own soul, my own faith. and. Um, and to go with that, I learned that a person will engineer whatever destruction they need to escape the pain they can't stand. And sometimes it's on the destructive kind that becomes public and, and is a scandal. In other cases, like mine, you just wear out, you're exhausted, um, you just think you cannot go on. But, but either way, it's a way of living out, uh, stepping out of that pain. So, which you I'm, don't I'm recommend. You don't I'm rec not recommending that. So I'm. You don't recommend trying to step out of it. Um, I, I think or, what or I recommend deny. is finding more honesty along the way. I think, through all of this pain, while Diane was processing her grief and going to therapy, I just pressed on and traveled too much, wrote too much, and didn't find the time and place to pause and breathe. So that's my encouragement to others, is get the help you need, 
um, the therapy you need. Um, step out for a while if you need to. I, my experience is church leaders are there and they're, want, they're on your team. They're, they're wanting to help if they can. And there's other kinds of grief besides these obvious terrible ones that, sure. that you experience. Yeah. There's all kinds of losses. There are all kinds of losses. That can stack up yeah. like this. That's right. That's right. Some of them have to do with just the natural process of aging, you know, the Absolutely. losing. Absolutely. We were talking about that. Yeah. <laughs> you and I, <laughs> the, yeah, two old the, guys. <laughs> yeah, the, those things you didn't see coming, uh, frustrations, and uh, no matter what they are, they do tend to build over a period of time. Now, that's not to say that we expect life to come without grief and struggle. You know, it's like winemakers say the best wine comes from stressed grapes. The grapes that were on hillsides that are windswept or didn't have enough rain. Something that, that caused them to work overtime. They may be smaller and shriveled, but they have, they have uh, better juice. And those of us who are Christ followers, uh, our story is one of, of grief and pain, so it shouldn't shock us. But even with that, there, there's a lot to move through in life's losses. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly not the first one to lose a child at the age of 10, but, but I found things that but you nobody felt could like have you told you. were the only one. <laughs> yeah, I found things nobody could have told you yeah. outside of that. So uh, this leads me to, to ask a couple of things. So you were ministering to the church who was dealing with a, the same loss that you were dealing with, just at a different dimension or different sure. intensity. Um, that reminds me of preachers I've known who preach their mother's funeral or preach their daughter's funeral or preach their, uh, you know, the funeral of somebody close to them. And I, I've always wondered, how, how do you do that? So was, was that ministry that you were providing to the church in these loss, these personal losses, do I hear you saying that was just depleting you? Or was there some sense in which it was fulfilling and cathartic and helpful to you? It, it was probably both. It may not be an either and. I think at the time, all of that was important to me. Um, I did my daughter's funeral by video. I knew I probably couldn't do it live. And that, that did find a place in me because I was her pastor, not only her dad, but her pastor. But over the long haul, not processing the grief at adequate levels left me a place. And I, I'm kind of a winter Christian anyway. You know? What does that mean? <laughs> well, some people are summer Christians. Uh, all prayers get answered. God's oh, evident. Right. You know, the, the God who is evident. Um, <laughs> God laid this on my heart. God told me this. And this verse spoke to me. And, and I've always been more of a winter Christian. I, uh, I connect more to the mysterious side of God. I don't... Um, I identified with Mother Teresa's journal in which she said she didn't receive a word from the Lord in 30 years, and yet she sought to move forward faithfully in the way of the cross. So I already have inclinations toward a kind of exhaustion that comes from doubt, um, mm. not, n not the hip <laughs> kind of doubt, you know, um, but, but the kind you don't want, you know, the kind that just nags and dogs uh, at your heels. But Having said that, uh, all of these things are for me now, um, these are scars. It's, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not bleeding emotionally today. I did find the help and these are the good old days. These are the best days of my marriage, the best days of ministry. Um, the most joyful time in my life is right now. And yet pockmarked around my soul and my body are some scars. I can show you the basal cell surgeries and the melanoma yeah. surgery and all those. Yeah. And inside, you know, those scars remain. You, you wrote a series of blog posts, wrote and, and curated a series of blog posts about, about Megan's death. Uh, on your blog, which I want to make sure I got the title right, PreacherMike.com. Yeah. Uh, everybody ought to go read that series, I think, especially if they're trying to minister to somebody who's dealing with loss or if they're dealing with it themselves. Yeah, what to say to a parent who loses a child. Yes, right? yes. Um, and in there you tell a story about an 84-year-old woman who was visited in the nursing home, I think, by a friend who, uh, and she said, well, how are you today? And she said, I'm sad because this is the anniversary of my daughter's death. And she said, uh, the friend thought, well, it must have happened last year or last yeah. month or something. And she said, oh, no, I, I, it happened 60-some uh, uh, years ago. Yeah. So caught him off guard. Just she's still grieving six decades later. And those of us who haven't experienced that level of grief, grief, tend to look at somebody like you 
and to say either they should be getting over it or he did get over it. And you're here to say, because of that speech about the scars, you, you haven't gotten over it. Yeah. No, it, it becomes different and it, it takes a different place in your heart, especially if you've worked through it. I love um, a book by Nicholas Wolterstorff called Lament for a Son. He wrote it after his son uh, fell off a mountain and died while mountain climbing. And in it, he talks about how Thomas only recognizes Jesus when he feels the scars. And Wolterstorff said, you won't really ever get to know me unless you're willing to feel that scar, you know. It's not that he keeps bleeding forever, but the scar remains. And by the way, it's, it's part of um, the deep meaning of the recovery movements is that it's a place without shame. It's a place where all of that's brought to the table and honesty and support and, and you seek to move forward one day at a time. Makes a lot of sense to me. An alcoholic's always an alcoholic. Yeah. Uh, and it kind of, but, but that doesn't mean they're still drinking. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but it is really an important part of their story. So that, that's an odd parallel to the grief thing, but I think, yeah. I, I, think I understand what you're saying. I found a, a friend actually took me to a 12-step group, uh, one that was open. You didn't have to be an addict. You could just give your name. But in the times I went with him, I found a real health there in the rhythm of it and the lack of shame that what, whatever you bring, whatever you need, if you're a minister and you're aggravated by doubts, that's okay. We're here to support one another to move forward uh, toward a better place. Well, Mike, I know that um, one way God is using you, your loss is to help a lot of other people move forward. And I'm, I'm grateful for the chance to talk with you about it for a few minutes. Thanks, today. Mark. Thanks so much Good for your time. Good to be with time. you, man. Yeah, man.